in digestion, food is changed by the organs into a soluble form to be absorbed by the body. Food in the mouth is mixed with saliva. Saliva begins to dissolve the food as the teeth grind and cut it. Food is forced back into the throat, pharynx, by the tongue. Food in the pharynx stimulates the swallowing reflex. The larynx is pulled upward to meet the epiglottis and seal off the trachea. Food goes from the pharynx to the esophagus. Food moves down the esophagus by peristalsis. The peristaltic wave reaches the esophageal sphincter and food enters the stomach. The unique muscular structure of the stomach breaks up the food into small pieces called chyme. Chyme exits through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum of the small intestine. The major portion of absorption and digestion occurs in the small intestine. The mucosa secrete enzymes that supplement the digestive enzymes of the pancreas and liver. This completes the chemical process of digestion. The walls are covered with villi where nutrient absorption takes place. The structure of each villus contains a capillary and lacteal to pick up the digested nutrients. The nutrients are now transported by the blood to all the cells of the body. The undigested food reaches the ileocecal valve and enters the large intestine or colon. The colon absorbs water, manufactures vitamins, produces mucus, and forms and expels feces. Mass peristalsis pushes the feces into the rectum, which stimulates the defecation. The pancreas is a gland that performs important roles in both the digestive and endocrine systems. It is located behind the stomach and next to the duodenum, which is the first section of the small intestine. The body of the soft, oblong-shaped pancreas contains both exocrine and endocrine glands. The main pancreatic duct runs the length of the pancreas and transports the pancreatic juices. The common bile duct empties bile into the pancreatic duct. These secretions flow from the pancreatic duct into the duodenum, where they will aid in the digestive process. Located along the sides of the main pancreatic duct, there are two kinds of exocrine glands that empty their secretions directly into the main duct. The acinar cells secrete pancreatic juices that will combine with bile to aid in digestion. The duct cells secrete an anacid fluid that is capable of neutralizing acids. After food is partially digested in the stomach, it flows into the duodenum as an acidic substance known as chyme. The secretions flowing from the pancreas mix with the chyme. The duct cell secretions neutralize the acid nature of the chyme. The pancreatic juices and bile aid in completing the digestive process. Pancreatic islets are located throughout the body of the pancreas and each islet contains two types of endocrine glands that secrete their hormones directly into the bloodstream. Gallbladder surgery. Let's get started. We're going to make an incision at the umbilicus and then insert a trocar. We'll place our camera down the trocar so that we can see it as it goes into the abdomen. Once we're inside, we inflate the abdomen with carbon dioxide and then numb the skin so we can make our other three incisions. Insert another trocar through the abdominal wall, a third, and our fourth and final trocar. These trocars allow us access into the abdomen 
so that we can place our instruments in and out of the abdomen to do the surgery. We grasp our gallbladder and retract it upward and you can start to see some of those stones floating around inside the gallbladder. We're going to just gently tease away this fat here that's near the cystic duct. The cystic duct is the duct that connects the gallbladder to the main common bile duct. And we just gently tease away that fat until we can see the cystic duct starting to come into view. This is the most important part of the procedure. We want to be very careful and make sure that we clearly identify that cystic duct going into the gallbladder so that we're not confusing it for some other structure. Behind the cystic duct we're going to start looking for our cystic artery which supplies blood to the gallbladder and you can see this pulsatile vessel coming into view now that is the cystic artery. Now that we have clearly identified the cystic artery and the cystic duct going to the gallbladder we'll start clipping these structures so that we can divide them. We always like to clip first and then divide. We don't want to create any bleeding or bile leaking by cutting first and then clipping second. Now that they're clipped we'll go ahead and divide the cystic duct and then the cystic artery. Now we're going to use an electric cautery device to dissect the gallbladder off of the liver. You can see this device does create some smoke but it's nice because it will cauterize any bleeding points as we move along the gallbladder. And we just march our way all the way up the gallbladder, freeing it more and more off the liver. And there we have it. Now that the gallbladder has been detached from the liver, we place it in this bag so that we can remove it from the body. But before we do, we'll take one more look under the liver just to make sure that there's nothing bleeding and making sure our clips are in good position. We can see that our cystic duct is adequately clipped. There's nothing leaking from it. And you can see the cystic artery is also very well clipped and there's no bleeding coming from there. And there's also no bleeding from the liver. So now we're ready to take out the gallbladder. We're just going to grab this string that's attached to our bag and pull the gallbladder out through this upper incision here. And there it is. We're just going to cut this gallbladder open so we can see what these stones look like inside of it. You can see some golden looking stones there. And that stone is about one centimeter. The danger is releasing the asbestos fibers into the air. When a worker breathes, asbestos fibers enter the mouth and nose and flow down the air passages deep into the lungs. The fibers lodge in the delicate lung tissue where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells 
try and break down the asbestos fibers and become damaged and die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more fibers embed in the lungs. Asbestos fibers can remain in the lungs for long periods and the scar tissue that results continues to develop for many years after exposure. Eventually, so much scar tissue develops that the lungs stop working. The pathogenesis of diabetes-related atherosclerosis involves several general mechanisms. The first relates to metabolic factors, including dyslipidemia, hypertension, increased free fatty acids, and hyperglycemia from insulin resistance with insulin deficiency, all of which contribute to the process of atherosclerosis, among other things. Hyperglycemia itself increases oxidative stress and glycation. This release of free radicals increases lipid and lipoprotein peroxidation, contributing to foam cell formation on arterial walls. Insulin resistance plays a role by contributing to endothelial dysfunction through loss of nitric oxide, an important precursor to atherosclerosis. Diabetes promotes platelet aggregation, which is the result of an increased inflammatory response that augments the generation of growth factors and also stimulates the proliferation and migration of smooth muscle cells, both of which are associated with thrombosis. Diabetes is considered a pro-thrombotic state, which can lead to an imbalance in atherosclerotic lesions and plaque instability. Diabetes-related atherosclerosis increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction. Percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as coronary angioplasty, opens narrowed coronary arteries. A small, hollow tube called a catheter is inserted into an artery in the groin or arm and threaded to the affected artery. A thin, flexible metal wire is then advanced through this tube and past the site of blockage in the artery. A second, smaller catheter is then inserted over the wire and threaded to the same artery. When it reaches the narrowed area, a small balloon on its tip is inflated to reopen the artery and flatten the blockage into the artery wall, while at the same time stretching the artery open to increase blood flow to the heart. Both catheters and the wire are then withdrawn. About 70 to 90 percent of coronary angioplasty includes placement of a stent, a wire mesh tube that holds open weakened arteries. The stent may prevent re-narrowing after an artery is widened, and it stays in place permanently as the blood vessel lining heals over it. Thigh or chest wall, and the incision at those points will be sutured and bandaged. Then your doctor will make a vertical incision in the center of the chest. Skin and other tissue will be pulled back in order to expose the breastbone. Your doctor will carefully divide the breastbone and a special instrument called a retractor will be used to hold the chest open. Once your doctor has a clear view of the heart, he or she will make an incision in the pericardium, a thin membrane that encloses the heart. Pulling the pericardium back will reveal the beating heart. We will gently rotate the heart to the right in order to allow access to the heart's underside. Using veins taken from another part of your body, the team will begin to build new paths for blood, bypassing the blocked areas of the old artery or arteries. The team will attach as many new veins as needed to the underside of the heart then the doctor will gently rotate the heart back to its normal position. To complete the bypass graft procedure, your doctor attaches ends of the new veins on either side of the diseased area or areas of the old coronary artery. Blood can now flow freely, avoiding the clogged areas that had caused your symptoms. 
The pericardium can now be closed over the heart. Your doctor will position two separate drainage tubes in the chest cavity. These tubes prevent fluid from building up around the heart during the healing process. The breastbone is closed with metal wire. A sterile bandage is applied. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of fatty deposits, including cholesterol, in the walls of arteries. It's a major cause of cardiovascular disease, including stroke and heart attack, and contributes to the death of around 70 million people worldwide every year. This short presentation illustrates the key stages in its development and its main impact on cardiovascular health. Cholesterol is a natural, fat-like substance and is essential to health. However, too much cholesterol in your blood can be harmful. Cholesterol is produced in the liver, but can also be found in certain foods, such as those high in saturated fats. There are many types of cholesterol. The main type involved in atherosclerosis is called LDLC, or bad cholesterol. Another type of cholesterol, HDLC, is called good cholesterol. It's important to increase HDLC as well as reduce LDLC when treating high cholesterol. A normal artery wall consists of three main layers a thin, smooth layer that lines the inside of the artery to help blood flow, a muscular, elastic layer that helps the artery pulse to push blood around the body, and a tough outer layer to protect the artery. The exact cause of atherosclerosis is not known, but several factors, including smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes and high cholesterol, are known to damage the smooth lining of the artery and contribute to atherosclerosis. Once this layer is damaged, the bad cholesterol, LDLC, can get into the wall of the artery. There are four key stages in the development of atherosclerosis. The body tries to defend against the invasion of LDLC into the artery walls by activating specialized cells called macrophages to consume the LDLC. They become enlarged cholesterol enriched cells called foam cells that are embedded in the vessel wall. The accumulation of foam cells can be seen by the presence of fatty streaks in the vessel wall. As the fatty streaks grow, the body tries to protect the artery from them by surrounding them in a fibrous capsule. At this stage, the growth is called a plaque. As the plaque gets bigger, the body tries to preserve the blood flow through the artery. The plaque expands into the elastic layer, which stretches in order to keep the opening of the artery the same. If the plaque continues to grow, its expansion will eventually intrude on the inner opening of the vessel as the elastic layer cannot stretch any more. This reduces the ability of blood to get through the artery. At this stage, physical symptoms such as angina may appear. Also, over time, calcium may be deposited in the plaque, making it hard and inflexible. This reduces the ability of the artery to expand to increase blood flow when needed, for example during exercise. As the plaque grows into the artery opening, it squeezes the blood through an ever smaller gap. The resulting increase in pressure at the narrowing can damage the capsule covering the plaque.
pollution. The presence or introduction into the environment of a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects on the environment, and even us. Pollution comes in a variety of different ways. It may come in the water, in the land, or even in the air. There are also two others, much less well known. Light pollution and noise pollution. However, those are not the worst of our problems. Pollution can ruin our ozone layer, it can prevent plants from growing, and even kill our animals. Let us start with a very dangerous, but little known form of pollution now, the dangers of land pollution. Land pollution can be formed through many ways including industrial activities, domestic waste, and agricultural activities. Land pollution is caused not just by landfills and domestic waste, but also by many other things including deforestation, which is the cutting down of trees, industrial wastes, such as nuclear substances, mining, and even some forms of mechanization. Domestic wastes, including landfills can be a huge problem. Domestic waste is the buildup of home garbage in a certain place. They are of a huge threat to the public. Landfills will attract detrivores and decomposers, which are in some cases, not good for the environment. But did you also know that there is air pollution? Air becomes polluted when noxious gases or black carbon particulates are released into the air. There are three main gases that cause air pollution. These are sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides. Sulfur dioxide occurs mainly when coal or oil are burned in power plants. This gas is also commonly found in smokestacks, as shown here. Clean equipment. Others are aircraft, diesel and railroads. Carbon monoxide is much like carbon dioxide, meaning that it is a harmful greenhouse gas. Nitrogen oxides only occur at higher temperatures. It facilitates and causes acid rain. It is known to cause eutrophication. It is caused, again, by transportation vehicles and power plants.
ये है गिरनार पर्वत हिमालय से भी पहले से खड़ा है इसकी गोद में बसा है गिर का जंगल भारत का एकमात्र जंगल जहां राज करते हैं 400 से भी ज्यादा एशियाटिक लाइन्स यानी बबर शेख राजा और प्रजा का अनोखा रिश्ता है क्योंकि शेरों के साथ इस जंगल में रहते हैं सैकड़ों इंसान यूं लगता है जैसे शेर इंसान की रखवाली कर रहे हैं और इंसान शेरों की तभी तो गिर में शेरों की आबादी बढ़ रही है सदियों से भारत के स्वाभिमान का प्रतीक है ये शेर और इनका घर है गिर यहां खुशबू है मेल मिलाप की पत्ते पेड़ों की शेरों की यहां खुशबू है गुजरात की अगर आप शेर दिल हैं तो रहिए शेरों के साथ में कुछ दिन तो गुजारिए गुजरात में